Have you ever drawn a sweeping conclusion only to find out on closer examination after getting more information or finding out some critical piece of information that your conclusion was wrong? Anybody ever found that? Anybody ever had a moment like that where you drew a conclusion and then after maybe getting closer examination or different information or some piece of information, all of a sudden what you'd thought was true, you found out you had an entirely different perspective and opinion on that thing. Uh, You saw the flip side of what you hadn't seen before. Has anybody ever experienced something like that? Maybe, Maybe for you, it was a someone. Maybe you drew a conclusion about somebody and you thought they were one thing and turns out you saw you after closer examination or experience, you found out it was something altogether. Maybe that was a bad thing. You thought someone was somebody they weren't and you found out the hard way after uh, an experience. There was the flip side to who you thought they were. Or maybe it was a positive thing that you didn't like someone at first, that you wrongfully got, you know, you had the wrong idea about them. Like my wife tells me about me when, when she first noticed me. She didn't like me. She didn't like my personality. I had to bust out blue, blue steel on her a few times and, you know, win her over with, with good looks. So my personality wasn't doing it, apparently. You ever have the wrong opinion about somebody? Maybe it was a something. Maybe it was a product. Maybe you, you know, maybe you were really excited to get a certain product because, you know, the commercial pitched it this way and you thought sold and you got the product and you found out what they didn't tell you. The flip side, that that it actually isn't that great after all. Maybe it was a a car that you wanted that turned out to be a lemon. Uh, maybe, maybe, Maybe for you it was a job that you thought this is the job I've been waiting for and then it turns out once you got into it on the flip side, it's not, it's not all that I thought it might be. Yeah, there's always a flip side, isn't there? Maybe for you it was an opinion. Uh, It's amazing to me the older I get how much my my political views have changed from the time I was in college and when I knew everything. Um, It's amazing how over time you can just change your opinion on things. Or or this one, this one will hit close to home. How many of you who, who, raise your hand if you have kids. How many of you, before you had kids, were the perfect parent? Remember that? Like, I remember my wife and I judging my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. Like, we wouldn't do that with our kids. And our kids, we're, they're going to join our lives. Remember that lie? <laughs> Imagine. Right? And then the flip side is, I found out you're just doing well. Just put one foot in front of the other. You got three kids. That's what I'm saying. No, we find the flip side. It's easier said than done. There's, there's more to the story, that there's always a flip side, that, that there's always more going on. And sometimes on closer examination, you find out that there's a flip side to what you had thought previously. We all have examples in our lives of our tendency to draw conclusions before we should have. That's why we have certain sayings in our world to help us remind ourselves of our tendency to draw, to jump to conclusions. We'll say, don't jump to conclusions or don't read a book by its, right, don't judge a book by its cover. Not read a book by its cover, that'd that'd be a quick read. Uh, Don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, It's not over till, till it's over. Yeah, some of you are going to say till the fat lady sings, I was waiting for it, but... Yes, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be politically correct, so we shouldn't do that. Yeah, but we, we all know that tendency in us to just make judgment and to, to make an opinion, and then after further examination, on further review, you saw the flip side to the story, and you all of a sudden had a different perspective. There's always and often a flip side, and I came today just really quickly. I want to talk to you about the flip side of life that is found when you find Jesus. That Jesus is the great, uh, the great piece of information, the great person, the great someone, the great experience, the great revelation that actually turns the page on your life and changes, changes everything. He is the one that turns the page on your life. He is the great flip side of all of our lives. I want to talk about the flip side just for a minute. And we're looking at, as we over the last few weeks have been journeying through the book of Genesis, and we've been looking at these old stories at the front of the Bible. Uh, and it's all about the book of the beginnings, it's called. The book of beginnings, the book of origins, where it gives us a framework, not necessarily to understand the world on scientific levels. We talked about that the first week, that people have tried to use Genesis to, to make, you know, scientific theory and to try to push it and make it reconcile. And that's not really the purpose of Genesis. And we found the hard way as Genesis leaves out a lot of very important details if you're, if you're trying to prove things scientifically. 
What we found out about the book of Genesis is Genesis is actually a metaphysical book. It's, it's, it's there to, to teach us something that God wants us to know about himself and ourselves and this world we live in. And so over the last few weeks, we've been journeying through the book of Genesis and here we get to Genesis chapter 6, and we found the destructive things that sin in the world has brought forth. In Genesis 3, we remember Adam and Eve, and we remember how sin became into, into the picture, and what happened immediately. There was this fallout that happened, and repercussions, and death entered the scene. And then last week, we looked at Cain and Abel, and you're going to start to see the deterioration of God's creation, how it went from Adam and Eve transgressing to now you have their sons, one son killing the other. It's this brutal progression of sinfulness and darkness in the world. And then if you keep reading in Genesis 5, it shows the generations getting uglier and uglier and uglier and things getting more sick and twisted and broken because of sin. Until we find in Genesis chapter 6, we find that, that God looked upon the world and he saw that every inclination of every heart in every, every person uh, was totally given over to sin. That people were dead in their hearts. They were dead in their sins, the Bible says. And so God comes and we see this story where this great flood happens and kind of washes over the whole creation. And now again, if we were trying to do this scientifically, we'd start to think, okay, how do you prove that there was a great cosmic flood over the whole earth? And that's not the point. Uh, there are some theories that it was a localized flood and there are great theories that it actually did cover the whole earth. I would, I would just tend to lean towards it says what it says, so I believe it. But nonetheless, the point is there's a deeper thing it's trying to show us with this great flood. And now for you, when you grew up, uh, you probably didn't read the whole, the whole account of the story of Noah's Ark. You probably were taught it, uh, maybe you grew up in church and you were taught it in Sunday school. Or maybe you just heard the story somewhere. And, and for you, it was probably presented quite cute, right? Like, like my little two-year-old has some things in our house that are like, you know, stuffed animals. It's this cute little story where the animals two by two march up onto Noah's Ark. It's oh, so cute and neat, get in the, get in the ark, you know, when you read it. It's a brutal story. Like, no, everybody else dies. Like, that's the story. Like, it's, it's a brutal story when you read it. And so at first glance, you, you, you probably didn't read it. You probably were just handed some version of it that was kind of cute. But then if you read it at first glance, your, your perception or your conclusion, if you don't look closer, you might be on the side that says, you know what? That is a brutal story, and I don't like what that makes God look like. And I want to just draw your attention for a minute, and I want you to see the flip side of this story, because this story, there's actually more going on than meets the eye, and you're actually going to see God from a different perspective if we look a little closer. But beyond that, I want you to know something else. As we've been learning in the book of Genesis, we've found out that this, this book is actually connected to a bigger story. We talk, we've learned how Genesis connects the Old Testament, and the Old Testament actually is all moving forward speaking about somebody. What's his name? Yeah, the answer is almost always Jesus in church. Yeah, it's speaking about Jesus. And so these stories that we read in the Old Testament are, again, they're setting the platform or they're speaking prophetically or they're a, a mirror image of what Jesus is going to come and do ultimately. That what's happening at a point in time, at a place in time, Jesus is going to come and fulfill in its fulfillment, in, 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 ultimate, in ultimate reality, Jesus is going to come and do that. And so we've looked and we found that there's more to the story. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 6 with me. And I want to just kind of re-examine it really quick. And I want to draw a couple conclusions that I think are going to encourage you. There's more about this story, though, when you look at it. And I need to, I need to set this up for you. That this story of Noah's Ark is actually pointing to a bigger story. It's pointing to the story of Jesus. That, that somehow what, what's happening with the story of Noah's Ark is a picture of what Jesus would accomplish entirely on the cross. We, we believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on a Roman cross a little better than 2,000 years ago and that he died there uh, for the sins of humanity and he rose on the third day in victory over death. And what happens in the Ark is a picture of what Jesus would do on the cross. And you need to see that as we look at it here. You need to see the flip side of Noah's ark, and you need to see Jesus in it. First uh, Peter chapter 3, Peter says it like this. Peter, the apostle who followed Jesus for three years and then uh, on whom the church was built. Look at this. Look what he says. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. Can I get an amen? Can Peter get an amen? He never sinned 
but he died for sinners. Who are sinners? Us, all of us. We learned that week one. We're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He died for sinners to bring you safely home. Get that picture in mind. Kind of like an ark, like how a family got on an ark with some animals and were transported to safety in the same way Jesus is that transport that takes you from death to life or from being endangered and being subject to the judgment of God to safety. Safely home to God. He suffered physical death. But he was raised to life in the spirit. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. God, did you see that? God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Later on, Peter talks about God's patience. Talking to Christians saying, don't think that God is being slow to return. He's actually being patient so that no one will perish. You see, God's heart is not for people to perish. God's heart is for people to live. And Peter wants you to see that God waited patiently while Noah built his boat. The door was wide open. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture. It's a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience, from something that happens inside of you. It's an outward picture of an inward decision. And so I want you to see here, as we look and examine the story of Noah, I want you to see Jesus in it. I want you to see the flip side of Noah's ark in the story. And I want you to see Jesus in it. And then I want you to see your own life as an invitation to come to Jesus and to get on the ark into life and salvation. Here are three quick observations. Really, we're gonna, we gotta, we got to move. Here are three quick observations I want you to see when we think about Noah's Ark. First is this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. What looked like punishment and death, at first glance, it looks like punishment and death, is actually mercy and life. What looked like an act of punishment and death is actually the Ark is mercy and and life. Noah's ark is a divine act of mercy. Look what Peter says in verse 20. He says, God waited patiently. What is mercy? Mercy is when God holds back what you deserve. Mercy is when he holds back the, the punishment that we all deserve. At a glance, it looks like God's angry. And in many ways, he really is. You got to understand God's justice. We don't like the word justice or judgment, do we? We don't like the word judgment, and we don't like the word justice if we're on the wrong side of it. But if you understand God's judgment, when, it talk, when the Bible says, like, God hates sin. You ever read those scriptures, like, God hates sin. He loathes it. He wants to pour out his wrath. We don't like to think about the wrath of God, do we? But if you understand love, then you would understand wrath. Uh, my, one of my favorite authors, a guy named A.W. Tozer, an old preacher, he said it like this, that God hates sin the same way a parent would hate the cancer that has taken the life of their child. Sinfulness is anything that degrades or destroys of life. And so if God is the father of life, the creator of all things good, and only is ever good, we talked about it last week, that God is only ever good, then his judgment and wrath is good in the sense that it is dealing ultimately with anything that destroys life. That's why God is judgmental. That's, or that's why God is wrathful. I would, I would be wrathful if someone or something was harming my kids. You're darn straight I would want to take out my anger on it. Wouldn't you as a parent? And so God, the perfect father of all creation, the Bible says he hates sin. He wants to deal with it. It's because it's destroying creation. Now here's the dilemma. Sin is in that which he loves. Sin is already in and affecting and infecting humanity. And so the, 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 the problem becomes that, that humans have chosen sin. And we talked about sin in week one, that sin is disconnection that comes from defiance from God, right? And sin is in all of humanity. And so here comes the great dilemma. God has to deal with sin, but he wants to spare his creation. He wants to spare his people. And so God makes a plan. He comes to Noah and he says, Noah, I've got a plan. I am going to deal with sin. I can't watch injustice. I can't watch rape. I can't watch uh, racism. I can't watch it any longer. I can't watch these things happen. I can't watch kids getting abused. I can't watch this any longer. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to wipe it off the face of the earth. Have you ever looked at you who are believers and thought the same thing? Like, why, why does God just let this happen? Because of mercy. 
He is waiting. Do you know the Bible says that, that not only has God unleashed flood, and the Bible at the end of Genesis chapter 9, it says God will never do that again. But if you read to Revelation, God will destroy sin ultimately by fire. And the only reason he keeps waiting is because there is an ark presented to humanity named Jesus, and he is waiting for more people to get on. And so we find here, though, what looked like punishment and death is actually mercy. Did you notice when I read it at the start in Genesis chapter 6, whose idea was the ark? It's not, a, it's, not, it's not a trick question. God's. It was God's idea. It was God that, that, that looked over all the earth and he found one person that would listen. One person whose ear was tuned into God, to what God was speaking. And he came to Noah and he said, Noah, there's a flood coming. I'm dealing with sin, but I want to provide a way out. And so here's the deal. You construct an ark, and this thing is going to transport you. It is going to take you over the floodwaters, and it's going to take you from what should kill you, and it's going to bring you to life. That's what the ark is. It was God's idea, and it was an act of mercy that brought about life. And now you need to see in this, Jesus is the ultimate ark. Jesus is the ultimate ark. Ark. What he has done has, is an act of mercy that was God's idea. God gave the specifications. In the story of Noah, at that point in time, it was an ark. It was a boat. Uh, when Jesus came, it was a wooden cross. That if you think about it, God in his sovereign uh, awareness would have saw the day that the seed germinated in the ground to create the tree that one day some Roman soldiers would chop down and carve into two planks on which he would crucify his son, God had a plan from day one that he was going to provide a way of grace, a way of mercy for humanity to get on the ark and be transported over judgment into life. That's the story of Jesus. Look what Jesus says. He said it himself. He said in John 3, 16, for God so, say it out loud, so loved, not, not, no, stop right there. God so loved the world. How often is your picture of God, angry God, with the smiter stick? No, God is the God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, not special people, anybody, aren't you, aren't you so thankful that God saves the whosoevers? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does believe, doesn't believe, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict, judgment. Light has come into the world. There has been a way made, but people love the darkness instead of light because, of their, because their deeds were evil. So Jesus says in John 3, 16, listen, everybody has sinned, but God loves you anyway, and God has prepared a way. He has made a way through Jesus that when you come to Jesus, you are spared. You are transported from the judgment that you deserve. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're all guilty. We're all guilty, every one of us. We aren't just affected by sin. We're complicit to it, aren't we? The Bible says we're all guilty, and yet God provided the way through Jesus to be spared the judgment, to be spared drowning in our sins and transported into life. I call that mercy. It's called grace. It's called mercy. We have all sinned. We've all been broken and corrupt, and we're all dying and facing death, every one of us. And Jesus creates the flip side to our lives. Jesus is our ark. The cross is the place where God destroys our sin and saves our life. That's the cross. That's the ark. The ark was the place where God's des God destroyed the sin and corruption of the world and began a new life in Noah. And Jesus did that ultimately. The cross is the place where God destroys our sin and saves our life. His death and punishment became our lives. That's amazing. You come to the ark today, you come to Jesus, and you find mercy. Right now, if you don't know Jesus, you stand condemned. Who's going to save you when you die? Who's going to forgive you of your sins? But when you come to Jesus, you receive life and forgiveness. You, receive, you enter the ark, and he takes you over the ultimate death, and he sets you forth on a brand new life. That's what Jesus does. Jesus, he is the one who dies your death. So your past drowns 
Isn't that amazing? Your sins drown. All your past mistakes, things that you've done, things that have been done to you, they drown. They drown and they rise again in Christ Jesus. Jesus creates the great flip side in your life. Observation number two. What looked like shameful rejection is actually a glorious acceptance. What looked like shameful rejection is glorious acceptance. At a glance, you see it looks like God is shutting out most of humanity, but in fact, God is actually inviting humanity into an ark to be reset and made right with him. There is an open door in the ark, and it was only after a time and where God waited and called people to say, hey, get on the ark, get on the ark. It was only after time that the door was shut, and when the door is shut, it is too late. There's this terrifying scene, if you've seen the Darren Aronofsky version of Noah's Ark. Uh, the door was shut, and the, the, the floodwaters are rising, and people are banging on the outside of the ark trying to get in, and at that point, it's too late. But here's the good news. Jesus, the ark, the door is still open. The door to salvation is still open. The door to right relationship with God is still open. And what he does is... When we should have been shut out and locked out, the Bible says that God calls us to himself and he actually accepts us as his own. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is so amazing. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ, through the ark. Do you see the analogy there? As you come to Christ, you are entering in that which can transport you back to God. You know what? You can stack all your morality, all your good deeds on top of itself for all of eternity and never reach God. But in one divine act of grace, Jesus died on your behalf, paid your sin. And when you come to him, the Bible says he exchanges your shame for his glory. You're accepted. He brought you back to himself through Christ. Let's keep reading this. And God has given us, the church, the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Here, this is amazing. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we're Christ's ambassadors, and God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ, and we, when we plead, come back to God. Come to Jesus. Get on the ark and find new life and leave your shame behind and be clothed in righteousness. Come back to God. Verse 21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Isn't that amazing? There's a better translation that says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That somehow when you come to Jesus, by God's grace, there is this great exchange. Jesus faced our shame on the cross. The Bible said he was crucified naked and humiliated, insults hurled at him. He, he bore our shame on the cross. All of your sin, you think of those things that you're ashamed of. Isn't shame horrible? Doesn't it just hang on you? There are things that you're so ashamed of. The Bible says Jesus took that on the cross, and when you come to him, he transports you into right relationship with, with God so that when God sees you, he doesn't see your shame that's on the cross. He sees the good deeds of his son. Jesus did it right. You know that? He never sinned. He never failed. God spoke over him and said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Get this. When you enter the ark, when you come to Jesus, your shame is gone and you step into that declaration where God says, this is my son. This is my daughter with whom I am well pleased. I don't judge you by your past. I judge you by my son. Isn't that incredible? How freeing is it? We've been made right with God. And get this, not just like God's cool with us, like we're forgiven, but God actually lets us know him. The Bible says that we've been called sons and daughters of God, that we can know God. Why? Because his rejection on the cross, do you, do you know that famous verse where Jesus was hanging on the cross and before he said it's finished, he, he, he cried out, I think it says like, Eloi, Eloi, lama sukbaktani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, the Son of God, for the first time in all of eternity, 
was facing rejection and disconnection from the Father. Ultimate, eternal separation, which none of you have experienced. The Holy Spirit has been working on you from the day you took your first breath. God, Jesus felt ultimate rejection on the cross. Your eternal rejection, my eternal rejection, so that when we come to him, we receive eternal acceptance from the Father. It's the great exchange. It's the flip side. Do you see that? His glory for our shame. It's a great exchange. Uh, uh, his, he took on rejection so we could be accepted. The cross is the place where God destroys our shame and gives us his glory. Can I get an amen? Maybe you came today and you are dealing with shame and you've never been accepted, never been rejected, you've never been accepted or never been loved. You've dealt with rejection. When you come to Jesus, you are accepted, you are beloved, you are redeemed, you are restored. Get this, the very thing that killed sin cleanses the new creation. The floodwaters, as it crossed over, as it, as it passed over all of the earth, Noah is brought into new life and a new standing with God. It says when they came off the ark, God blessed them. It said, we're good. Uh, bless you. Be fruitful and multiply. Go in my covenant. And that's what happens. That water that kills becomes the very thing that cleanses us in our new identity in Christ. See, Jesus is the great flip side. The old is gone. The new has become. The new has begun. I'm not who I was. I'm a new creation, clothed in righteousness. I have a great track record. His name is Jesus. That's good news. Third thing, and I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to get the band to come back. I told you I was going to be quick, didn't I? I was, tr I was telling the truth. You know you're winning when the pastor tells the truth. You're, we're doing good, right? Like, that should not be cause. That should not be cause for celebration. Here's the third observation, and I'll, and I'll wrap up. What looked like a cursed end was actually a blessed beginning. When you first glance at the story of Noah's Ark, it looked like this brutal ending to everything God had made. Like, you remember how awesome it was in Genesis 1, the story of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and God said, let there be earth, and let there be humans. And he saw them, and he saw that it was good. And then you see this tragic downward spiral, and it seems like everything's done, and it's over. It seems like this brutal end, but in fact, it's this great new beginning. And from whom, get this, Noah begins the march, the steady march of humanity to the moment of the cross. It's significant in the Bible. Numbers are significant. Numbers matter, especially in the Old Testament. There's just the whole, this whole way of uh, God communicating to us through numbers. They, they carry values and meanings. And, and the number seven means perfection or completion. Uh, number, tw number 12 means God's governance being established. Whenever you see that, number 40, like when it talks about the, the, the rain for 40 days and 40 nights, well, it's not necessarily meaning it literally, although it might be, but what it's trying to communicate, 40 means a season. It means a duration. When it was done is what it means. Five means grace. And it's important that you notice this in Genesis chapter, chapter 9 when uh, they, they came off the boat. It tells us that eight people, eight people got off the boat that day. Eight people came off the ark. And the number eight is significant because the number eight is the, the number of new beginnings. Number eight means a new start. It's a fresh day. It's a new humanity is what that means. We talked in week one or week two about the, the regenesis in Jesus. And that's what Noah's Ark is pointing to right here. That, that these ones, these humans that came off the Ark represent, represent a new humanity. And in the same way, in a more ultimate way, when you come to Jesus, get this. Your old life is over. It's gone. It's done. The old you, you have died to yourself. Some of you need to hear that and that's the best news you've ever heard because you want to get away from it and you need a flip side. You need a new story. You need a fresh start. Some of you need to be reminded of this. You need to take up your cross. This is where, this is where you know, your, uh, my perfect dream for my life, this is where just follow your heart dies. You crucify it on the cross and say, I have failed to live a life that brings me real meaning in life and I am dying to myself and coming to Jesus. And when you do that and you die to yourself and you say, you be king of my life, you define me, you hold my future, you hold my past, you hold my today. When you do that, the old you dies with Jesus on the cross 
and spiritually speaking, and someday in the, in the physical body, the Bible even says, you became a new creation and you start into a new life. Look how Paul says it in Romans chapter six. This is amazing. He says, for we died and were buried. Do you have that, Romans chapter six? No? Shoot, listen close. Yes, we do, good. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by glorious, by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves, that old busted, broken me, those things that I did and those things that were done to me, they were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Sin was washed over by the waters, and you step in free to a new life, a new beginning. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. If a guy says, I'm going to die and rise again, you can trust what he says. Amen? We know this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also, here it is should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. That's amazing. When we come to Jesus, when you come to Jesus, to the ark, the old life is gone, a new one has begun, and you have been resurrected, raised up in Christ Jesus, and that becomes your new identity. And all the privileges thereof, like Ephesians 1 says, that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. God isn't withholding anything back. God, there's nothing we need, to, we need to kind of obtain. God's given it to us in Christ Jesus. We have privileges of sons and daughters. That's amazing. The cross is the place where the old life ends, and a new one begins. The cross is that moment, it is that critical moment that becomes the flip side. It becomes the, that moment that changes the old for the new. That's what Jesus does. Jesus is the flip side for your life. He is the place. He is the one that takes your old and makes it new. He takes your mourning and makes it dancing. He takes your rejection and makes it acceptance. He takes your shame. He gives his glory. He deals with your death and gives you his life. He takes your despair and gives you hope. He takes your, your poor and your poverty and gives you riches. He takes your blindness and he gives you sight. He takes your lostness and he finds you. He takes your nightmares and he gives you a dream. He takes your chains and gives you freedom. He takes your fear and he gives you courage. He takes your tears and he gives you joy. Jesus is the flip side of your life. You got to know him. He's the place where you get a new story. He's that one who transports you from the old, dead, broken life you had to a brand new life with a hope and a future into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. No one can take it. No one can mess with it. You belong to God. And anything you face in this life has to pass through his hand of permission. And even the bad things that you face, if you belong to God, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, for we know all things come together. God causes them to come together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I belong to God. Who can separate me from the love of Jesus? Not height, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor nakedness, nor sword, nor anything else can separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus. I'm a new creation. Every once in a while, especially as a pastor, I'll get this a lot. I didn't, know, I didn't get it a lot before I was a pastor, but maybe you have encountered this. Every so often, someone will come up to me, and it's almost like they want me to know what a person really is like that comes to King's Church. Sometimes I'll get emails. Sometimes someone will corner me and say, hey, did you know, did you know what they used to do? Did you, did, you know, did you know what she was up to? What, you know, I recently had someone send me a picture of someone who was baptized here a while ago, and they tried to inform me about what they used to do. And you should, you know, they have your, here's your poster child on your baptism. 
And the more I encounter that, I try to respond with grace and just try to keep, the, keep it moving. But in my heart, I just want to, yeah. Because what they don't know, what you might not know, and if you've ever done that and you've seen maybe your friends come to church and you're like, oh, they're all big on Jesus now and they, I know what they were like. Well, here's what you don't know. That's not their story anymore. That died with Jesus. You see, the reason you come to the cross in the first place, because we know we're not perfect. We know we need grace. We know we need life. We know we need forgiveness. That's why we came to Jesus in the first place. So stop trying to define them by their past when, when God defines them by God's Son. And so when we celebrate baptism today, we celebrate a life that has been flipped. Someone that has gone from death to life, Someone whose sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus and they have been born again into righteousness and right standing with God. They can know that God is for them, not against them. That when God sees them, he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. This is my daughter with whom I'm well pleased. You see, Jesus has flipped every single life that you're going to see baptized. All the ones in at East and at West and at Halifax and here. Every single one of them is a testimony of Jesus writing a brand new story. Is anybody thankful today that Jesus has written you a new story? Hey, let's stand, stand together at all of our locations. And let's just pray. Father, we thank you today. That when we came to Jesus, the old has been passed away and you exchanged it for the new. You took our debt and you gave us your riches. You took our shame and you gave us your glory. God, thank you that our sins died the day Jesus died. Thank you that our shame died on Jesus' on Jesus's cross. Lord, thank you that when we come to Jesus, he transports us. He transports our lives from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from brokenness to healing, from purposelessness to purpose. I have a hope and a future in Jesus. And so, Father, for every person who's seen the, the, the page of their life turn, God, we just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for every person today that's going to be baptized. Lord, we celebrate that Jesus, you didn't just turn one page, you've turned billions and you're turning them all the time. Every day, your mercies are new. Every day, you're exchanging the old for the new. The old is gone, the new has begun, that you're doing a new thing in our midst and we thank you today. So Father, we celebrate and we celebrate all that you've done in us. Would you remind us, God, as we see people take that step of baptism, would you remind us that it's by grace we have been saved through faith, not because of anything we have done but the gift of God that it's by your mercy this was your idea and we thank you for it and all God's people said amen give God a great shout of praise in this place